All right, this week we're doing a double portion, Tazria and Metzora. Um, and the predominant theme is leprosy, or, well, Sara'at. We're going to see that leprosy is a very bad translation. Um, but let's just get stuck in. This week's double portion has the central theme running through it, that of uncleanness of various sorts and its management, how to deal with uncleanness. It's all linked in with holiness and being set apart. Underlying this is the theme of carefully watching and inspecting oneself, one's attire and one's house. Your daily life, everything that you do on a day-to-day basis, carefully watching it, inspecting it, guarding. You know when he says guard these commands, this was about guarding oneself and keeping watch. We're told to watch. So what is leprosy? The word translated as leprosy in the Hebrew is tzara'at. Though tzara'at is most often translated as leprosy, it has almost nothing in common with the disease we know by that name today. Um, the translation came about because in the Septuagint, tzara'at was translated as lepra, which in the Greek meant rough or scaly. So this apparition was scaly. That made me think actually of the, the serpent in the garden. Um, later English translations made the connection from lepra to leprosy. That's how we associated leprosy with Sara'at. That's the process. But in ancient Greece, what we now call leprosy today, Han- is Hansen's disease, is modern day leprosy. That was called elephantiasis in Greece. But elephantiasis today is something different. So we can see how words change meanings. So leprosy, well, modern day leprosy, i.e. Hansen's disease, was not Sara'at. I believe it would have fallen under that umbrella term, as we will see. Um, though Sara'at and the Torah is a combination of the physical and the spiritual, many scientists and doctors have made attempts to connect Sara'at to medical conditions. Maimonides, who was a physician himself, recognised that Sara'at was probably comprised of a few different skin diseases that were all malignant and destructive. If who, those who have read the portion, you've seen like you could have scabs, you could have boils. You, there were various manifestations of it. Um, I lean to this understanding that it comprised several diseases. So modern day leprosy might well have fallen under the umbrella term of Tzara'at. Saferno understood the forms of Tzara'at to be skin cancer and others to be punishment for sin. Modern medical scholars have identified the white spots described as symptoms of tzara'at as vitiligo, a disfiguring but otherwise harmless disease, or psoriasis, a disease that results in thick silvery scales and itchy dry red patches on the skin. That would marry up to the understanding of the Septuagint where it said it was scaly and rough. Pardon? Yeah. It takes a doctor to know that. (laughs) It would seem that quite a few conditions could fall under the umbrella term of tzara'at. As as we're going to see, you could have tzara'at of the skin, of the clothing, of the house. Tzara'at is a malignant infection or rot, thus being a representation of death. And as we're going to see, it it was a way of manifesting something that was going on inside a person. The rabbinic traditions, traditional Jewish thinkers have understood Sara'at in a variety of ways. The Talmud lists seven reasons why one might be afflicted with the disease. Gossip, murder, perjury, forbidden sexual relationships, arrogance, theft and envy. The Midrash focuses on gossip, as have many more modern and contemporary commentators connecting the word Metzora. Metzora is the leper, or the stricken one, to Motsi Shemra which means he who brings forth an evil name. So character assassination, essentially, gossip, slander. Narmanides viewed Sara'at as a withdrawal of godliness from the world. This explained why it could manifest itself in the walls of one's home. So as a, a house or family moved and drifted away from God, 
Sara'at of the house would start appearing and manifesting in the house? Mold. Yeah, mold. I have mold. <laughs> <laughs> oh. if, if someone sinned and then began noticing green or red streaks on the walls of his house, this was an indication that as a result of his sin, God's presence was removing itself from his home. So it's this interesting analogy that you know, the more sin comes in, the less room there is for Yah to be there. You know, and if we're attend and so forth, the image is really powerful, actually. Rabbi Samson Raphael Hirsch pointed out that because Sara'at was treated by priests rather than doctors, it shouldn't be interpreted as a medical problem at all, but rather as an exclusively spiritual ailment, which is correct. When you had leprosy of, or tzara'at of whatever kind, you went to the priest, not the doctor. So it's a spiritual problem manifesting itself in a physical way. Where in scripture did the rabbis get these ideas, you may say? Let's look. In Numbers 12, it says, Now Miriam and Aharon spoke against Moshe because of the Cushite woman whom he had taken, for he had taken a Cushite woman. And they said, has Yah not spoken only through Moshe? Has he not also spoken through us? And Yah heard it. And the man Moshe was very humble, more than all the men who were on the face of the earth. And suddenly Yah said to Moshe and Aharon and Miriam, you three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three came out. And Yah came down in the column of cloud and stood in the door of the tent and called Aharon and Miriam. And they both went forward. And he said, hear now my words. If your prophet is of Yah, I make myself known to him in a vision and I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moshe. He is trustworthy in all my house. I speak with him mouth to mouth and plainly and not in riddles. And he sees the form of Yah. So why were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moshe? And the displeasure of Yah burned against them and he left. And the cloud turned away from the tent and look, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow, and Aharon turned toward Miriam and look, a leper. In this story, Sara'at was a result of slander and usurping authority. Take like speaking against Yah's chosen people, as it were, those he's put in power. But the, problem, the, the main thing is slander and usurping authority. Aharon and Miriam's motives are actually very similar to that of Korah. If you look at the language, has Yah not spoken through us as well? What did Korah say? Is not the rest of the congregation holy? Let's look at another incident. Uzziahu, King Uzziah, was 16 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 52 years in Yerushalayim, and his mother's name was Yecholiah of Yerushalayim. And he did what was right in the eyes of Yah, according to all that his father Amatsyahu did. And he sought Elohim in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of Elohim. And while he sought Yah, Elohim made him prosper. I love that. When he sought him, he gained. He was prospering. And he made machines in Yerushalayim devised by skilled men to be on the towers and the corners, to shoot arrows and large stones. And his name spread far and wide, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. But when he became strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction, for he trespassed against Yah, his Elohim, by entering the Chechal of Yah to burn incense on the altar of incense. That's the temple. Um, and Azariahu, the priest, went in after him, and with him were 80 priests of Yah, who were brave men. And they stood up against sovereign Uzziahu and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziahu, to burn incense to Yah, but for the priests, the sons of Aharon, who are set apart to burn incense. Get out of the set apart place, for you have trespassed, and there is no esteem to you from Yah Elohim. That must have took something, you know, to stand up to the king and say, get out of here. And Uzziahu was wroth, and he had a censer in his hand to burn incense. And while he was wroth with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead before the priests in the house of Yah, beside the incense altar. 
And Azariah, the chief priest, and all the priests looked at him and saw that he was leprous upon his forehead. And they hurried from there. And he also hurried to get out because Yah had struck him. And sovereign was Yahu was a leper until the day of his death and dwelt in a separate house because he was a leper, for he was cut off from the house of Yah. And Yotam, his son, was over the sovereign's house, ruling the people of the land. In this instance, Sara'at was a punishment for pride, arrogant, and defying the set-apart matters, taking worship into one's own hands. Again, this is a spiritual problem, and it's being dealt with with a physical like, manifestation. In 2 Kings, and Naaman, Naaman's commander of this army of the sovereign of Aram, was a great man in the eyes of his master and highly respected because by him, Yah had given deliverance to Aram. And he was a brave man, but leprous. That's, it, that's interesting. Yah's using a so-called pagan. And the Arameans had gone out on raids and he had brought back a captive young girl from the land of Yisrael and she served the wife of Naaman. And she said to her mistress, If only my master were with the prophet who is in Shomeron, then he would recover him of his leprosy. Naaman basically ends up going to Elisha, Elijah's sort of protege, and told to, he's told to wash seven times in the Jordan. I'm not going to get into the details, you can read the story. He, but he does so begrudgingly, and his flesh is restored. And then we keep going. And he returned to the man of Elohim, to Elisha, he and all his company, and came and stood before him and said, See, now I know that there is no Elohim in all the earth except in Yisrael. And now please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As Yah lives before whom I stand, I do not accept it. And he pressed on him to accept it, but he refused. Then Naaman said, If not, please let your servant be given two mule loads of earth, for no longer is your servant going to make a burnt offering and slaughterings to other mighty ones, but to Yah. The earth would have been to make an earthen altar. If you read in the Torah, Yah says, if you're going to make an altar to me, you make it of earth or unchiseled stone. That's what that would have been for. Does it have to be earth from Israel? That's another debate, I think. Um, they would have seen it as taking a piece of that and, you know, taking a piece of Yah's land, as it were, and bringing it back. So it would have been the spiritual connotation. But the earth itself wasn't, like, magically imbued with something. Do you know what I mean? It's still dirt. Technically, all the earth is Yah's, does not the psalmist say. Yah, grant forgiveness to your servant in this matter. When my master goes into the house of Rimon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow down in the house of Rimon, when I bow down in the house of Rimon, Yah, please grant forgiveness to your servant in this matter. Then he said to him, go in peace. And when he had gone from him, so this is interesting. I don't want to get into this too much, but it's this idea of what's acceptable, what isn't. I don't want to get into it, because uh, this one you can argue it on both sides. And when he had gone from him some distance, but Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of Elohim, said to himself, Look, my master has spared Naaman the Aramean, while not receiving from his hands what he brought. But as Yah lives, I shall run after him and take whatever from him. And Gehazi pursued Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he came down to the, from the chariot to meet him and said, Is there peace? And he said, Peace. My master has sent me, saying, Look, even now, two young men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please, please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. A talent was about 34 kilos of silver. Uh, so we did the, the mass way back. This was a lot of money. As we will see from Elisha's words, this would have set him up for life. And Naaman said, please accept two talents. So you've got like... 68 kilos of silver there and he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them the, to two of his servants and they bare them ahead of him and when he came to the high place he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house and let the men go and they went and he went in and stood before his master and Elisha said to him where did you go Gehazi and he said your servant did not go anywhere 
But he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to accept silver and to accept garments and olive trees and vineyards and sheep and cattle and male and female servants? Uh, Elisha knew what he was going to use that silver for. It would have been enough to buy garments, olive trees, vineyards, servants. Imagine the servant, like, he's not said anything and Elisha knows all this, like, whoa. So let the leprosy of Naaman cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from him as leprous as snow. Sara'at was a punishment for greed and using a prophet's authority for ill gain. Again, spiritual principle, and he was cursed for it. So, I went through all this so that we have a correct understanding of what Sara'at is before we even delve in the Pasha regarding Sara'at. People think it's just a disease. No, it was a supernatural punishment for something going on inside. It was seen as a spiritual chastisement for sin that was occurring on the inside of a person. It was a way of manifesting what was hidden from everyone else. Yeshua had a few words to say about this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside they are filled with plunder and unrighteousness. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish so that the outside of them may become clean too. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly indeed look well, but inside are filled with dead, ben, dead men's bones and all uncleanness. So you too outwardly indeed appear righteous to men, but inside you are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. And so they've... In essence, they've got leprosy on the inside. Something that's dark inside will eventually get manifested. Yeshua says this, Meanwhile, when an innumerable crowd of people had gathered together so that they trampled one another, he began to say to his taught ones first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. And whatever is concealed shall be revealed, and whatever is hidden shall be known. So whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light, and whatever you have spoken in the ear in in a room shall be proclaimed on the housetops. Yeshua's hinting at the day of judgment there, when all the books are opened. But this is where Tzara'at comes into play. Something's inside, you're hiding it from everyone, Yah brings it to the surface so that he's giving you a chance to deal with it. It's out of mercy that he does these things. So now let's actually get into the portion with that foundation. And Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, When a man has on the skin of his body a swelling, a scab, or a bright spot, and it should become on the skin of his body like a leprous infection, then he shall be brought to Aharon, the priest, not the doctor, or to one of his sons, the priests. And the priest shall look at the infection on the skin of the body, and if the hair on the infection has turned white, and the infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is a leprous infection. And the priest shall look at him and pronounce him unclean. But if the bright spot is white on the skin of the body and does not appear to be deeper than the skin, its hair has not turned white, then the priest shall shut up the infected one seven days. So you get put in quarantine. And the priest shall look at him on the seventh day and see if the infection appears to be as it was and the infection has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall shut him up another seven days. And the priest shall look at him again on the seventh day, so 14 days later, if the infection has darkened and the infection has not spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. It is a scab and he shall wash his garment and be clean. Remember, this would have been a manifestation of something going on inside. So in this little quarantine, this is the period of time where the person might start getting on their knees and start introspecting and start going, Father, what is it that's inside me that you need to purge out of me that's manifesting? And this person has dealt with it. But if the scab spreads further over the skin after he has been seen by the priest for his cleansing, he shall be seen by the priests again. And the priest shall look and see if the scab has spread on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is leprosy. When the infection of leprosy is on a man, then he shall be brought to the priest. 
And the priest shall look and see if the swelling on the skin is white and has turned the hair white and there is a spot of raw. F- so there would have been raw flesh. You've got this idea of open wounds. It would have been quite a horrible sight. In the swelling, it is an old leprosy on the skin of his body, something that is returning. And the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He does not shut him up for he is unclean. The imagery is actually quite powerful. You've got this idea of like a malignant problem. Something that you... It keeps coming back. It keeps coming back. If sin has gone from the surface level, so it says if it's, it said if it's deeper than the skin or not as deep as the skin and it's seeped deep into someone, that person must be cut off. They must be put into quarantine first. And if it spreads, well, put them out the camp. The process of sin is fivefold. It starts in the mind. So temptation will present itself. Sin will appear at the door and it's in the mind. You have the choice whether to, you know, so what, what does Paul say? You have to guard your thoughts and uh, take every thought captive. But no, the, what happens if you don't take it captive, you end up dwelling on it. You think about it and you're like, oh, I don't know. Ooh, ooh. Then it goes down to the heart. When we've thought about it enough, it, it, it goes deep. It sinks down. Once it's in the heart, eventually it will come back out as an action. You, what does Yeshua say? The mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Once you do those actions many times, it becomes a habit. And that habit, over a period of time, then becomes a destiny. So it all starts up here. Really what we need to do is make new habits. Break old habits, make new ones, good habits. Like the writer of Hebrews says, stir up one another to do good works. Make a habit of it to do good works. Everyone with me? (laughs) If leprosy breaks out all over the skin, and the leprosy shall cover the skin of the infected one from his head to his foot, wherever the priest looks, then the priest shall look and see if the leprosy has covered all his body, he shall pronounce the infected one clean. It has turned all white. He is clean. It doesn't make any sense, does it? This is what I put out to the men during the week. I was like, think about it. Think about it. See what you can come up with. And I got the fact that he turned all white. Therefore, you know, white purity. I said something at the beginning. I don't know if you called it. What does leprosy represent? What was it a manifestation of? Sin. What does sin represent? What's the wages of sin? Death. He has been completely covered, swallowed up by death. Think about that. He's completely covered. He's swallowed up by death. Yeah, let's break it down. Leprosy represents death. When someone has been completely swallowed up by death, they become clean. What happens when you die? The payment of your sin has been paid, hasn't it? We have the choice to die unto self, die unto the flesh. Now, what does Yeshua say? That a seed, for it to give life, it must die completely. By completely dying to self and dying to the flesh, one becomes clean. Remember, the, 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 the thing covered the flesh. The flesh is dead, so to speak. Therefore, put to death your members which are on earth, whoring, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, greed of gain, which I, all these things are idolatry. I want, I want this, I want that. Because of these, the wrath of Elohim is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you also once walked when you lived in them. But now put off all these, displeasure, wrath, evil, blasphemy, filthy talk from your mouth. Do not lie to each other, since you have put off the old man with his practices and have put on the new one who is renewed in knowledge according to the likeness of him who created it. Where there is no Greek or Yehudite, circumcised and uncircumcised, foreigner, Scythian, slave free, but Messiah is all and in all. Everyone get that? But the day raw flesh appears on him, he is unclean. So this is the person that's been completely covered by white. He's completely died to self. But the day that raw flesh appears on him, he is unclean. 
And the priest shall look at the raw flesh and pronounce him to be unclean. The raw flesh is unclean. It is leprosy. What's really interesting is the language. Let's look at the language of verse 14. Here it says, uh, Basar Chai. Basar is flesh. Chai means life, living. So a better translation of this verse 14 would actually be, but that in the day that life appears in the flesh, he is unclean. So basically, he's gone from, his whole body is being swallowed up by death, he's died unto self, but now the flesh has come back to life. Do you see? And because the flesh has come back to life, he's now unclean again. And it's the raw flesh that's unclean. It's the living flesh. That's what makes you unclean. So t- tie this to what Paul was saying. The deeds of the flesh. These are the things that need to be dead. When someone who has died to self and to sin begins to allow the flesh to live, he becomes unclean again. This is why we must guard. It's almost like, You've got, once you've put to death the old man, you've got to stand over the grave and just stay down like. <laughs> when we slip back into sin, we are allowing the leprosy to live and to come back again. This is the spiritual sort of picture that's being played. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his, fo- his folly. I won't dwell on that too much. When the raw flesh changes and turns white again, he shall come to the priest. And the priest shall look at him and see if the infection has turned white. Then the priest shall pronounce the infected one clean. He is clean. Again, let's look at the language. This one here, which is turns, is yashuv. Shuv is the root word of teshuvah, which is repentance. So when the flesh that was alive turns why it turns from what it was doing then you can be pronounced clean so you stop this is someone that's slipped back into sin and they've repented there is forgiveness for those that slip back into sin the answer lies in dying to the flesh and dying to self there is forgiveness amen yes but the wrong if he turns shuv same word, if he turns from all his sins, which he has done, so he, his flesh has turned white again, and he shall guard all my laws and shall do right ruling and righteousness, he shall certainly live, he shall not die. All the transgressions which he has done shall not be remembered against him. In his righteousness that he has done, he shall live. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wrong, declares the Master Yah? Is it not that he should turn? Shuv from his ways and live. It's amazing the, the mercy, the compassion. Le, going back to the leprous guy, he would have he's he's literally been completely covered over, he's died to self, he's been clear for a while, and he slips back into sin, raw flesh starts appearing on him, but he can turn. There's still that option to turn. One more thing. Here it says, uh, we read this at the beginning, the priest shall look at the infection. Um, the King James translates it as plague. Uh, it's probably a better translation, actually, plague. Um, it's the word nega, which means stroke, plague, disease, stroke, wound, uh, a mark. So you, you, you've been sort of, it's your plague. By changing the vowel points, you get this word, naga, which means to touch or to strike. It's a dual fold word, so you, it can be like, I've touched you on the shoulder. It can also mean, I struck you with violence. This, this same sort of thing. So we have naga, which means to touch or to strike. We have nega, which is the plague itself. Let's see where these words are used. Truly, he has borne our sicknesses and carried our pains, yet we reckon him stricken. Nagar, same word, smitten by Elohim and afflicted. 
He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our crookedness. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. We all, like sheep, went astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way, and Yah has laid on him the crookedness of his soul. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, but he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, but he did not open his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. He had asked for his generation who considered that he shall be cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken mega. Both words appear in that passage. So there's a messianic connection. This is, if in Judaism, there's this thought of the leper Messiah. That, you know how they believed in uh, Messiah ben David and, and the suffering servant. There was this idea, and they had this idea that the Messiah will be able to take leprosy from people. This is where the, this is the passage they get this line of thinking from. By leper Messiah, they weren't saying he was going to be. Some people said he would be leprous, but hey, hey, that's their deal to deal with. How did Messiah heal lepers? He got it. He touched them. Those stricken with leprosy were here when the Messiah touched them. Nagar, Nagar. There's the link there. Let's look at the incident. And the leper came to him, calling upon him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you desire, you are able to make me clean. And Yeshua, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him. That would have been that word, Nagar. Or nega, I, I get the next up, and said to him, I desire it, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. He took upon himself our sicknesses. He was beautiful. And having strictly warned him, he immediately sent him away and said to him, See, say no say none to at all to anyone, but go show to yourself to the priest. And offer your cleansing, for your cleansing, what Moshe ordered as a witness to them. As a, wit- uh, that's a, as a witness to them. It is, Yeshua is following the Torah. In part two, we'll look at the offerings of what this would have consisted of. I just love the connection from leprosy to either the messianic prophecies and Yeshua literally fulfill the, fulfilling them. Um, the, the rabbis of Yeshua's time believed that the coming Messiah would be able to heal an Israelite from leprosy, that he would be able to heal a lame man from birth, and there was another one, that he would be able to cast out deaf and dumb spirits. And that's exa- he did all those things. And th- this was rabbinic tradition, and he was saying, guys, I'm doing all this stuff, and you still won't accept me. Why do you think he was almost kind of like, come on? It's funny because you can have all the head knowledge and you can know the scriptures inside out and you can even have the correct interpretation but you can miss it being fulfilled in front of your very eyes. That's what happened to the Pharisees. I mean, they were so strict and not... When Yeshua was being crucified, before he was being crucified, like, they wouldn't go into Pilate's court because they didn't want to become unclean to keep the Passover, completely missing the fact that Passover is being fulfilled in front of their very eyes. Again... Head knowledge can be dangerous. Let's look at leprosy of the garment. So already put your garment caps on, you know, your garments are your works. Let's remember that. And when a garment has an infection of leprosy in it, in a woolen garment or in a linen garment, so when your works, your deeds become infected, there's something hidden inside that's being manifested out. Or in the warp, or in the weft of linen, or wool, or in the leather, or in any leather work. And the infection shall be greenish, or reddish in the garment, or in the leather, or in the warp, or in the weft, or in any leather object. It is an infection of leprosy, and shall be shown to the priest. So, yeah, what do garments represent? Your deeds, your works, or lack thereof. And the priest shall look at the infection, and shut up the infected one seven days. This is the equivalent to being put out of the camp, you know, being put into quarantine. And he shall look at the infection on the seventh day. Same process. And when the infection has spread in the garment or in the warp or in the weft 
or in the leather or any leather work, the infection is an act of leprosy, it is unclean. And he shall burn that garment or the warp or the weft in wool or in linen or any leather object in which the infection is, for it is an act of leprosy. It is burnt with fire. That's interesting. Uh, it reminds me of the passage, um, I think it's Hebrews, when he says that all our works will be put through the fire, whether of gold, silver, wood and hay. The garments are being put through the fire. But if the priest looks and sees that the infection has not spread in the garment or in the warp or in the weft or in any leather object, then the priest shall give the command and they shall wash that garment which the infection is. And he shall shut it up another seven days. Again, same process for the garment as for the person. And the priest shall look at the infection after it has been washed and see... If the infection has not changed its appearance, though the infection has not spread, it is unclean. Burn it in the fire. It is eaten away in its inside or outside. This is interesting. Like even, if there, even if you stop sinning, but then there's no sign of change. So let's say the sin has been stopped or removed. If you still don't change, you're burned. This... To me, it really hit me hard, this idea of complacency, not wanting to better oneself. Apathy. Because you can go, oh, well, okay, I'll stop doing that. But then you just stay where you are. You're not moving forward. And if the priest shall look and see that the infection has faded after washing it, then he shall tear it out of the garment or out of the warp or out of the weft or out of the leather. And if it is still seen in the garment or in the warp or in the weft or in any leather object, it is a spreading infection. Again, it's malignant. Burn it with fire, that in which the infection is. And if you wash the garment or in the warp or in the weft or in a leather object, if the infection has disappeared from it, then it shall be washed a second time and shall be clean. It had to be visible. This is the interesting thing. You had, you had to be able to make a visible discernment whether there was a change. And the change had to be a shrinking. It, di it didn't say if it disappeared. It said if it shrunk. Which is interesting. It is only when sin has visibly shrunk that the cloth was kept. So let's, let's look at this. The, the garment has had an infection. And then it's shrank and it's been torn out. Okay, This is speaking of a garment that... A garment someone's deeds that has had sin but it has had it torn out of its life not cut torn this is like quite a painful process shall we say it is safe to assume that this is someone who has been put through the fire and has had some experience and wisdom you know you've been crushed a garment that's had the sin ripped out of it is, is a person that's been put through the press and come out the other side with some scars i'll be it this garment has a hole in it, maybe several. With this mentality, let's look at what Yeshua said. And he also spoke a parable to them. No one puts a piece from a fresh garment onto an old one. Otherwise, the fresh one makes a tear. Also, the piece that was taken out of the fresh one does not match the old. If you look at the context of this, it's all hypocrisy, religious show. The, the, the Pharisees were saying to Yeshua, well, why don't your disciples fast and pray like we do? And look at us being so holy. And, he's, and so he's pointing out hypocrisy. The old cloth, that which has been put through the refinery and has some holes in it, has shrunk. Look, because you, you don't put fresh cloth on because it will shrink once you've washed it and then it tears the, the old garment. So old cloth has shrunk after it's been passed through the refinery. It has become lowly, humble, lost the pride by being washed. It was the washing process that made the cloth shrink. So please note, the washing, the refinery makes you small, not puffed up. The new cloth still has to be humbled by having its leprosy or hidden seal revealed to the surface and thus torn out. This is what makes it... Do you see the parallel I'm trying to draw? With that in mind, let's look at 
what Paul said. Trustworthy is the word. If a man longs for the position of an overseer, he desires a good work. An overseer then should be blameless, husband of one wife, sober, sensible, orderly, kind to strangers, able to teach, not given to wine, no brawler, but gentle, not quarrelsome, no lover of money. That's a big problem today. One who rules his own house well, having his children in subjection with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to rule his own children, his own house, sorry, how shall he look after the assembly of Elohim? Not a new convert, lest he become puffed up with pride and fall into the judgment of the devil. Again, you don't put fresh cloth on old cloth. Because the fresh cloth is puffed up. It's got pride problems. You see this when someone who's new or walking the faith and they're all guns blazing and flashing the, the Hebrew this and this. And it's like, calm down. Calm down. Be lowly. Be humble. Be meek. Let's look at the word for match. The, the piece that was taken does not match the old. This is the Greek word, symphoneo, to be harmonious, to be in agreement. Has this, it's this idea of being in agreement. If you break down the word symphoneo, it's, it's two words, sum and pho, phone, uh, with and then sound. So phone is a tone, so it's basically like a sound, a voice. It can be used of voices, instruments, words, languages. So... In harmony, it resonates. Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, that's where we get it from. So when it says it does not match, it does not, it does, it's not in harmony with, that there's like a discord. Yeah, it does not match. The new cloth, i.e. the new convert, will not be in harmony with the old cloth. It's always those that are spiritually immature that cause problems in fellowships that cause division those that have been through the ringer a few times have been made low been humbled that you know they'll quietly stand in the background and watch and only step in do you see the difference when put in a position of authority the new cloth the new convert will become puffed up and it will cause a tear in the old cloth this is why you don't put fresh converts in positions of authority. They will cause a tear. They will, you know when someone has authority and they don't know what to do with it and they kind of like misuse it for their own personal gain. Well, well I have the power, so off you go. They cause a tear. If they don't cause a tear, they cause disunity. The word match has this idea of being in agreement as well. They cause disagreement. The new cloth listen to this, has to be given the chance to shrink. Then it may be sewn into the garment. Once the new cloth has become old cloth, then you can put it in. How did the new cloth become shrunk? It went through the washing process. It was refined. It had the leprosy brought out, it was torn out, and they still came out the other end. Do, are people connecting the dots that I'm trying to... I know it's quite... A, yeah. What, Well, this is the next verse. It speaks of, you know, the um, wineskins. The very next verse of that is the wineskins. Um, but I just love the imagery in there. As soon as, when I was reading the, the leprosy of the cloth, and then I realised, hang on, this garment has a hole in it. It's, it you, everything Yeshua said had purpose. In the next part, we're going to look at the offerings in regards to the leprosy. This one I wanted to kind of pull out the spiritual implications. I hope that's been a blessing so far. Let's have a break and, yeah. So, in part two, we're going to look at dealing with Saha'at, how it was dealt with, how you were cleansed from it and the rituals that were associated with it. Let's look at them. And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, 
This shall be the Torah of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. So when Yeshua healed that leper and he said, go to the temple and do what Moshe offered, this is what this leper would have done. And the priest shall go out of the camp and the priest shall look and see if the leprosy is healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command and he shall take for him who is to be cleansed two live and clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command and he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. And let him take the live bird and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop Dip them in them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird loose in the open field. There's the parallel between Yom Kippur. What, you had two animals, one was slain, one was released. In this instance, it's the two birds. In the Yom Kippur, it was the two goats. There's a parallel there. I don't quite fully understand it, but there's a similarity. Wood, scarlet, hyssop, a substitute. Does it sound familiar? Yeah. After this, Yeshua, knowing that all had been accomplished, in order that the scripture might be accomplished, said, I thirst. A bowl of sour wine stood there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, and held it to his mouth. And when Yeshua took the sour wine, he said, It has been accomplished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. All this, and note how it had, the bird had to be killed over, uh, it said flowing waters. The, the term there is mayim hayim, living waters. This idea it had to be done over that. Again, the, the imagery is so powerful. In death there is cleansing, there is life. These aforementioned items and the live bird were to be dipped in the blood of the bird that was killed. All of them. The live bird was then set free. It's one dying for the other. There's a clear substitution going on. What powerful imagery the Torah truly does speak of Yeshua. You know, when he said that the Torah and the prophets speak of me. It's just amazing. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird loose in the open field. And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his garments and shall shave off all his hair and wash himself in water and shall be clean. Then after that he comes into the camp but shall stay outside his tent seven days. Just notice that link this to the parallel of when we were off in the world, we were leprous as it were. We were outside of the camp. When we turned to Yeshua and accepted this walk, accepted this faith, what did we do? We cleaned our garments. We started doing righteous things and not doing sinful things. And then what did we do? We you were immersed you were bathed in water there's a perfect type and shadow here of coming to faith then you get to come into the camp but then you shall stay outside his tent seven days and on the seventh day it shall be that he shaves all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows even all his hair he shaves off and he shall wash his garments and wash his body in water and shall be clean he that has been cured of leprosy, i.e. stopped living in the flesh, must wash his garments and bathe in water. I've just gone through the, top, the analogy of this. He must also shave all his hair off. The eyebrows, beard, the lot, everything from here. Some people think that it was a full body sort of thing. That's up for debate. A newly cleansed leper would have looked very much like someone else mentioned in the Torah. And this is the Torah of the Nazarites. When the days of his separation are completed, he is brought to the door of the tent of meeting. And he shall bring his offering to Yah. And then it goes through all the offerings he had to bring. These were the ones that Paul would have had to bring when he paid for the Nazarite vows of them five other people. 
And the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tent of meeting, and shall take the hair from the head of his separation, and shall put it on the fire which is under the slaughtering of the peace offering. So someone who's just been cleansed of leprosy looked like a Nazarite that had completed his vow. Looked like one other set of people. And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel, and you shall cleanse them. So you've got the sprinkling with the blood. They would have had to wash their garments, bathe in water, and do this to them to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of sin offering on them, and they shall shave all their body, and shall wash their garments and cleanse themselves. And shall take a young bull with its grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, while you take another young bull as a sin offering. So now a newly dedicated priest would have looked the same. So it's when we come into Messiah, what do we become or hope to become? Kings and priests. There's a similar. Can you see the links? Uh, and, pardon. Yeah, a new creation. Um, ancient rabbinic thought kind of goes along the idea of you shave your body because you look like a child. You're a newborn, as it were. There's this idea, that's what they used to say. So let's go back to the portion, the leper that is being cleansed. This is after the seven days of like, So he's being cleansed. He's had to stay outside of his house for se- another seven days. It's on the eighth day that he takes two male lambs, perfect ones, and a one ewe, one ewe lamb, a year old, a perfect one, and three tenths of an ephah mix of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering and one log of oil. And the priest who is cleansing shall present the man who is to be cleansed with these offerings before Yah at the door of the tent of meeting. And so no, again, notice that rec- reconciliation happens on the eighth day, the type and shadow of after the millennium. And the priest shall take one male lamb and bring it as a guilt offering and the log of oil and wave them as a wave offering before Yah. And he shall slaughter the lamb in the place where he slaughters the sin offering and the burnt offering in a set apart place. For the guilt offering, like the sin offering, belongs to the priest. It is most set apart. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil, and pour it in the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before Yah. And the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest puts some on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the, gu- on the, blood of the guilt offering. And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's right hand, he puts on the head of him t- t- who is to be cleansed, and the priest shall make atonement for him before Yah. This should all sound very familiar to something we did recently, a few weeks ago. Who can guess? No, that's not what I was thinking of. The blood on the ear, on the thumb, on the toe. Same with the oil. You got it. When Aaron and and the priests were dedicated, and this is the task you shall do to set them apart to serve before me as priests. Then you shall bring Aharon and his sons to the door of the tent of meeting and wash them with water. Same thing again. Take the anointing oil and pour it on his head and anoint him. So it's happening in a reverse order. The oil first, then the blood. And then you shall take the second ram, and Aharon and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the ram, and you shall slaughter the ram and take some of its blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aharon and on the tip of his on the tip of the right ear of his sons and on the thumb of their right hand and on the big toe of their right foot, and sprinkle all the blood around on the altar. There's definitely a link between someone who's being cleansed of leprosy, the priests, the Nazarites. There's this idea that now you've given up and you've been cleared of everything past, you are now dedicated. You are set apart unto service. I know there is more there to dig at and to uncover. Let's look at the cleansing process. Once the individual has to be, once the individual has 
been cleared of leprosy, he had to bring two male lambs and a ewe lamb. We just read that. We know that those who were poor were afforded to bring cheaper offerings, as it were. If you couldn't afford a, a, a goat or a sheep, you could bring birds. And if you couldn't do that, you could bring flour. But if he is too poor, if he is poor and unable to afford it, then he shall take one male lamb as a guilt offering to be waived to make atonement for him. Notice it's the lamb that's making atonement. And one tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering and a log of oil, and the two turtle doves or two young pigeons, such as he is able to afford. And one shall be as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. And he shall bring them to the priest again on the eighth day for his cleansing to the door of the tent of meeting before Yah. No matter how poor you were, you needed a lamb as a guilt offering to provide atonement for you, to be cleansed of leprosy. So you could be clean from leprosy, but if you didn't go through this ritual, you weren't allowed in the temple. You, you were <laughs> clean from leprosy, but not clean before Yah, if that makes sense. And something that I realised about this is that being cleared of leprosy was quite a process. You, you, first, you have to bring the, the, you know, the two birds and you have that whole thing. Then you wait seven days. You're not allowed in your house. Well, you don't, you know, where are you? Exactly, outside, in the elements. Um, and then you have to bring that. When you're a leper, can you work? You, you couldn't work. You, you weren't allowed to be around people. You're allowed to be around other, other lepers. Like, you, you could be, you'd be on the wayside, you know, people would walk past you and shun you, but you wouldn't have been able to work, earn a living. Lambs weren't exactly cheap. Do you mean? It was a very costly thing. Well, you could sell yourself, become a servant to make the money, or you could take a loan from someone. You're told that if someone comes to you and needs something, you're to give. You know, so someone should be helping you. you it should, this would have been probably a joyous occasion. You know, like, think of the prodigal son. He went off, he was dead, now he has returned. You've got a perfect parallel there with the prodigal son and the leper who's being cast out. He's being cleansed, he's returned. He was as if he was dead. Remember, leprosy is death. And he's being brought back. Rejoice. Bring the fatted calf. But it would have still been an expensive and laborious process, which should make us think, you know, that becoming clean is going to be a slow, laborious process, often costly. What does Yeshua say? Count the cost. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's don't get leprosy. Again, the imagery here is very powerful. It had to be the blood of the lamb had to be lamb again why messiah only the blood of the lamb can atone for our spiritual leprosy you can't change that this shows how even if one keeps the torah perfectly the blood of the lamb is still needed to atone for and cleanse from sin because let's just i said this earlier you could be cleared of leprosy but you needed the, that blood of a lamb to, so that you could come back into the temple. So that you could go back into your own house. This is why it's so crucial. So crucial. You know, again, Torah is good. Don't go, you know, I'm not, Torah is not on the stand here. But that alone, you need that and the blood. So let's look at the actual process. First, you were separated from the camp until your leprosy had gone. The priest couldn't magically heal you. You were, you were separated until you repented or Yah showed mercy on you. That's it. You were out. On being pronounced, so you come back, you're healed. You would offer the two birds and you do the cedar, the wood, the scarlet, the hyssop. You would then be allowed in the camp, but not in your own home for one week. Then on the eighth day, you would offer two male lambs and a ewe lamb, or one lamb and two birds if you were poor. Only then was there full restoration. On the eighth day, once you'd gone through the process, it, again, this was costly, timely. It, 
It wasn't just, oh yeah, I'll just get cleansed just like that. And I think Yah made it purposely so. So you are pronounced healed but not cleansed. So being healed, you could still work as people would accept you. you. Well, you wouldn't have been allowed in your own house and you wouldn't have been allowed in the temple. So maybe you could have worked. But, which is interesting because if you look at the, the first stage was, what, the two birds, wasn't it? That's, that was, that's representing Messiah, the cross and stuff. And then you still needed to like, apply that blood. If that, there's a process. Again, there's more there to, to dig from. And I don't quite see the full depth of it, but there's threads to pull at. Scarlet threads. <laughs> so we've looked at leprosy of the body and cloth. That be, let's look at leprosy of the house. And Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, When you come into the land of Canaan, which I am giving you as a possession, and I put a plague of leprosy in a house in the land of your possession, who's putting the plague there? When he does it. Hmm. Then shall the one who owns the house come and inform the priest, saying, It seems to me that there is some plague in the house. <laughs> I love it. There's almost a community. I think there's a problem going on here. <laughs> and the priest shall command, and they shall empty the house before the priest goes in to look at the plague, so that all that is in the house is not made unclean. And after that, the priest goes in to look at the house. So here, notice that everything is emptied out of the house. Everything that's inside is revealed. And it's, it served the purpose to, you know, to salvage what could be in there. And notice that the, 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 it's preventative measures rather than, oh my goodness, let's do everything last minute. You, you do preventative measures. This is what our attitude should be. Not doing, not, some people say, okay, what's the least I have to do when doing this walk? You should, no, you should be doing what's the most I can do. Preventative measure. If that makes sense. And he shall look at the plague and see if the plague is on the walls of the house with sunken places, greenish or reddish, which appear to be deep in the wall. Again, deep, has it gone below the surface of the skin? Is it in the very material of it? Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. Again, he didn't go to the architect or to the builder. He went to the priest. Same process, shut the house up seven days. Where are the people staying for seven days? And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look and see if the plague has spread on the walls of the house. Then the priest shall command and they shall remove the stones with the plague in them and they shall throw them outside the city into an unclean place. Yeah, it's meant to be the leprosy on the brick wall. It was really hard finding that, you know, without like some big thing, anyway. While he lets the house be scraped inside, all around, and the dust that they scrape off shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. I mean, they're really like stripping it. Everything that was hidden inside the house is brought out into the open. All your possessions are now being brought out. Anything that was secret, brought out. Then the plaster is all scraped off, chucked out. This also served, I said this, uh, for the purpose of salvaging what good was left. Preventative measure. In Peter we have this. Having put aside then all evil and all deceit and hypocrisies and envyings and all evil words, as newborn babes desire the unadulterated milk of the word in order that you grow by it, if indeed you have tasted that the master is good, Drawing near to him then, a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by Elohim and precious, you also, as living stones, are being built up into a spiritual house, a set-apart priesthood to offer up spiritual slaughter offerings acceptable to Elohim through Yeshua Messiah. Leprous stones will not be allowed to remain in the house of Elohim. Are you a leprous stone? It's a rhetorical question. Don't put your hand up. <laughs> Are you a leprous stone? Remember, there was a seven day incubation. 
again, what, when a day is a thousand years, this time we have now is the time we decide. Do, do you see what I mean? This is our incubation time. Eighth day is when the priest, the high priest, will come and inspect the house or the leper or the garment, probably all three. You know, we're a house, I'm me, I have my... Do you see what I'm trying to say? On the eighth day, he will pronounce us leprous or not leprous. What happens to the leprous stuff? Burnt, crushed, pulverized, put in an unclean... Anyway. And they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones and take other mortar and plaster the house. See, remember, if we're a house, you're a stone, you're a stone, I'm a stone, you're a stone. Some stones are going to have to be plucked out every now and then. The new stones are going to be put back in. And if the plague comes back and breaks out in the house after he has removed the stones, after he has scraped the house and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come back and look and see if the plague has spread in the house. It is an act of leprosy in the house. It is unclean. Then you know that the problem is not just the stone, it's the house itself. The whole thing is corrupt. And he shall break down the house, its stones and its timber, all the plaster of the house, and he shall bring them outside the city to an unclean place. If a house continues to break out in leprosy, even after the leprous stones have been taken out, it must be destroyed. Again, this happens on the eighth day. We are now, day seven, eighth day is fast approaching, Well, yeah, and it, it says that the priest did it. It was at the command of the priest. Imagine having to destroy your own house and take it to an unclean place. And everyone would know as well. That's the part of it. Everyone would know, oh, yeah, they had leprosy in the house. Hmm, I wonder why. And that actually becomes a test to other people. Then do you start gossiping about the leprous people, thus becoming a leper yourself? I mean, anyway. This is a stern warning to any family or fellowship. The family is referred to as a house, a fellowship, a, a congregation is a house. We have the imagery of plastering over infected walls, don't we? It says that you take the stones out and then you put new ones in and then you apply fresh plaster. And if it breaks out in leprosy again. And the word of Yah came to me, Ezekiel chapter 13, saying, Son of man. Prophesy against the prophets of Yisrael who prophesy, and say to those who prophesy out of their own heart, hear the word of Yah. This is talking of a people that claim to know him. They, bear, they claim to bear his name. They're not saying, thus said Baal, thus said Mole, they're saying, thus said Yah. Thus said the Master Yah, woe to the foolish prophets who are following their own spirit without having had a vision. O Israel, your prophets have been like foxes among ruins. You have not gone up into the breaches, nor do you build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in the battle on the day of Yah. What were foxes do? That they were scavenging for food, looking out for themselves, rather than building up the wall. Are the prophets, are the leaders, who are they serving? Themselves or the flock? Their visions are false and their divinations a lie, saying, Thus declares Yah, when Yah has not sent them, yet they expect the word to be confirmed. <laughs> I'm just I'm gonna say this, just look at the crazy the crazy stuff that goes on in the charismatic movement. They say, Thus said Yah. They proclaim peace. Have you not seen a false vision? And have you not spoken divination of lies? You say Yah declares when I have not spoken. Therefore, thus said the Master Yah, because you have spoken falsehood and seen lies, therefore I am against you, declares the Master Yah. This thing of I am against you, you read that language in Leviticus in the curses. He will himself will go, it's a horrific passage. My hand shall be against the prophets who see falsehood and who divine lies. They shall not be in the council of my people, nor be written in the record of the house of Yisrael. And they shall not enter into the land of Yisrael. You shall know that I am the Master Yah. This was uh, Ezekiel was writing to a people in captivity. 
to the house of Israel in captivity. And they were saying, yeah, we'll just go back. Everything's fine. They were out the camp. They were lepers. Because, yea, because they have led my people astray, saying, peace, when there is no peace. And when one is building a wall, see, they are coating it with whitewash. Now we get, I, I had to go through the context to get to this bit. Say to those who coat it with whitewash, it shall fall. They shall be flooding rain, and you, O great hailstones, fall, and a stormy wind breaks it down. In the leprous house, what were they doing? Just get rid of that, and then just cover it up. A bit like what David did, he covered his sin up. And see, the wall shall fall. Shall you not be asked, where is the coating with which you coated it? Therefore, thus said the master Yah, I shall break down with a stormy wind in my wrath and a flood in rain in my displeasure and great hailstones in wrath to consume. Uh, Where do you read all of this stuff? Great hailstones, wrath, floods, revelation, end times. And I shall throw down the wall you have coated with whitewash and bring it down to the ground and its foundation shall be uncovered. And it shall fall and you shall be consumed in the midst of it and you shall know that I'm now. He's literally going to show, show what it's built on. He's going to bring it down and reveal it for what it is. So I shall complete my wrath on the wall and those coating it with whitewash and say to you, the wall is no more, nor those whitewashing it. Uh, what was the wall made of? Stones. People. The prophets of Israel who are prophesying concerning Jerusalem and who are seeing visions of peace for her when there is no peace, declares the Master Yah. The, the whole thing is speaking of people in power, the prophets, saying peace. You know, it's fine. You can keep going in your sin. Though you're a sinful people, you can keep going and Yah's going to bless you. Hmm. And he who goes into the house all the days while it is shut up becomes unclean until evening. And he who lies down in the house has to wash his garments. And he who eats in the house has to wash his garments. If a house represents a fellowship, a group of people lying down in the house, you know, what, what, do you, what does he say? You know, come out of her, my people. You're, when you're in uh, spiritually adultery, what are you doing? You're lying down in a house. And he who eats in the house has to wash his garments. Eating the word or the bread of that house. Are you eating in an unclean house? Even being in a house with leprosy makes one unclean. This should make us wary of staying in congregations that are leprous. I've seen this time and time and time again. And I nearly fell foul of it. That... You know a congregation is not following the word. I'm not talking about getting it perfect, but about wanting to even follow the word. Some people are like, oh, no, nah, like, yeah, we know that Torah stuff, but, you know, we've done it already sort of thing. You shouldn't even be staying in that house. And people will justify it saying, well, I need to be a light to them. And I need to try and help them. And I need... He doesn't say we're told to come out of her, not to fight her, not to try to convince her. Come out of her. Why? Because eventually, bad company corrupts good morals. If you lay down with dogs, you rise up with fleas. What about staying at a friend's house that can be I'm not. I'm, I'm speaking more in a spiritual sense. You know, it doesn't. It, it, it's not saying you can't go to the house of an unbeliever. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about staying in congregations that don't want to change. They're unclean. They're not trying to be. It's going to make you unclean eventually. Because you, you can only stop yourself for so long. Eventually, you will start falling in in line with them. Yeah. I'm not talking about going and having a fellowship meal. I'm talking about staying, laying down, resting there. Digging roots there, eating there, in a, in a spiritual sense. Come out of her. Don't try and come. They've got their own journey to do with. I, just, I don't know. It just saddens me. Like, 
You know, Paul says, uh, you shouldn't think of yourself more highly than you ought. If not, you'll fall down. This is what people are doing. They're justifying staying in these congregations that are leprous, and they're justifying, they're, well, I'm going to help them. I'm going to do this. So no, notice I. It's a pride there that I'm going to be their saviour. I'm going to be their Mashiach. I mean, really? And I nearly fell foul of it. When Yah told me to come out of that congregation, I ummed and unard, but I knew that I had to, because it's either fall in line with them or be an outcast. I'm not saying don't warn, but don't stay there. Do you see the point I'm trying to make? However, if the priest indeed comes in and looks at it and sees that the plague has not spread in the house, after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. And to cleanse the house, he shall take two birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And she shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water and shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the live bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water and shall sprinkle the house seven times. That he shall thus cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the running water and the live bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet. And he shall let the live bird loose outside the city in the open field and shall make an atonement for the house. It shall be clean. Again, it's the same, it's the same ritual. A ritual that is the shadow of atonement brought forth by Messiah's death. Pardon? Minus the lamb on this one. It seems to be that leprosy of the house is, I don't know, I don't want to say like something lesser, but a house is just an inanimate object. Whereas the person that's living, it takes a greater cost. You need something of equal value or greater than to atone for it. Let's look at um, discharges and stuff like that. Not literally look at some, but you know, <laughs> I would recommend that. And Yah spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge from his flesh, his discharge is unclean. And this is his uncleanness in regards to his discharge. Whether his flesh runs with discharge or his flesh is stopped up by his discharge, it is uncleanness. Anyone or anything, basically, that was touched by an unclean person had to be washed in water and remain unclean until evening. So, I'm, let's just say I have a discharge and I'm unclean and I touch you or I spit on you or you were then unclean, you had to bathe and then be unclean until evening. If I, any object, my, my phone would become unclean. You'd have to rinse it in water, then it would be clean again. Anything, beds, couches, Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, damn cloth. But it, it, it was highly contagious. There's a verse in Haggai that uh, Yah is speaking to Haggai, and he's saying, if you have set-apart bread and you put it in the, in the nap of your thing, and something unclean touches it, is the bread clean? And he says, no. And he says, this is how the house of Israel are to me, actually. He says, you're just all unclean. But um, it... Yeah, it's, it's, it spreads. This is the point that uncleanness spreads just like that. Just by touching it. What if someone who was hiding their discharge touched you? Well, someone who's hiding their discharge, you would still be unclean. We, there's, a, there's a Torah report, uh, in the Torah somewhere it says that if a matter of uncleanness comes upon you and you don't know it, you're still unclean. And the moment you, you're, you're made aware of it, you have to make a, a much atonement for it. Which should make us think about the courage that the woman who had the flow of blood, how much, because she, do you know what I mean? She came into a crowd of people. Think about that. She needed Messiah that much. And the earthen vessel which he who has the discharge touches has to be broken and every wooden vessel has to be rinsed in water. This is another reason why the earth must be broken up because we walk on it. We're the lepers. We're the unclean ones walking on the earth. 
We, we said in the Torah, por- in Vayikha, in the first Leviticus portion, that because the blood of Messiah has been shed on the earth, it must be broken up. Well, another reason is because we, we pollute it. It's a nice thought, isn't it? And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall count for himself seven days for his cleansing and shall wash his garments and shall bathe his flesh in running water and be clean. And on the eighth day he takes for himself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and shall come up before Yah to the door of the tent of meeting and shall give them to the priest. And the priest shall prepare them, the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for him before Yah because of his discharge. It's interesting, and I said this in the break, that um, this individual doesn't, hasn't necessarily sinned. They've just got a problem. But the, what, what, why do we have these problems? Because we're mortal. That our flesh is corrupt. It's a reminder of death. That we are degenerating. That has to be atoned for in the face of a holy Elohim. This is why you get that verse in Isaiah that our righteousness is as filthy menstrual cloth. That's the Hebrew there. Our righteousness. His righteousness, however, though, that he's given to us, something altogether different there. Our impurity needs to be atoned for before a holy Elohim. And when a man has an omission of semen, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until evening. And any garment and any leather on which there is semen shall also be washed with water and be unclean until evening. And when a woman lies with a man and there is an omission of semen, they both shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Why would the act of lovemaking and procreating result in us becoming unclean? I used to wonder about this. I mean, surely it's a good thing. I mean, Yah created us to go forth and multiply, did he not? Why would that result in us being unclean? One, one view is that when you lose, uh, when you discharge, whether it be blood or seed, you're actually losing life. That life is leaving your body. We know that life is in the blood. So when a woman, a woman was losing life, there's that in analogy. You... Yeah. We read this last week. Show me favor, O Elohim, according to your kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me completely from my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone, I have sinned and done evil in your eyes, that you might be proven right in your words. Be clear when you judge. See, I was brought forth in crookedness, and in sin my mother conceived me. In sin you were conceived. This is uh, actually the, when it says, you know the Torah portion is called Tazria, is that word, to conceive. While we may be bringing forth life in the act of marriage, we are actually bringing forth death. As we are born sinful and born destined to die. When a child is brought into the world, that child will die. Do you see what I'm saying? This is why I believe it makes you unclean. It's not the act itself. Because Yah has given us as a type and shadow of what union with him will be eventually like. But the fact that we... Mortality brings forth mortality. Even in our attempt to bring forth something pure, we cannot. That doesn't stop us. By the way, like, that doesn't take the onus away from you from trying. But it's a reminder that in Job it says, who brings forth the clean out of the unclean? No one. We're unclean. The only way that something clean is going to come out of us is, guess what, if you die, and he lives inside of you. With me so far? And when a woman has a discharge, and the discharge from her flesh is blood, she has to be in her separation for seven days, and whoever touches her is unclean until evening. And what... Is unclean until evening on the same day? Yeah, on the same day. So... Any time during, even if it was like just before, like 
evening. Just before evening. Just before evening. Just before evening. Just before evening. Yeah, you, as long as you bathed. Yeah. Yep. It was during evening. Well, you'd have to wait until the next evening. I'll just, you know. Just there, this means that when a. Not to be graphic, but when a woman comes on a period, she would, you, you then start your count of seven from that moment. Generally speaking, by seven days, it's over. And whatever she lies on during her separation is unclean. And whatever she sits on is unclean. And anyone who touches her bed has to wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever touches any object that she sat on has to wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And if it is on her on and if it is on the bed or any object on which she sits, when he touches it, he is unclean until evening. And if any man lies with her at all and her monthly flow is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and any bed he lies on is unclean. What this sounds a bit harsh, you know, separate the woman, but most people don't realise this means the woman would have had a week off. She wouldn't have been cooking, cleaning, she wouldn't have been in the house, she would have been separated. She would, do you see what I mean? That even in separating the woman out, there's mercy there. She gets a period of time, like me time as it were. Okay. Before people use verse 24 to justify having relations with someone on their monthly flow, I'm, I'm not trying to be graphic, but some people will say, oh, I'll just be unclean for seven days. Let's see what Yah has to say about that. Any man who lies with a woman during her sickness and uncovers her nakedness, he has laid bare her flow, and she has uncovered the blood flow of her blood. Both of them shall be cut off from the midst of their people. This idea you should not be uniting with something that is in an unclean state. That's the picture there. But if a man is righteous and shall do right ruling and righteousness, if he has not eaten on the mountains, it's talking of pagan high places, nor lifted up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor comes near a woman during her uncleanness, if he walks in my laws and he has guarded my right rulings in truth, he is righteous. He shall certainly live. Which means that coming near a woman during her flow is unrighteous. It's also a big grip, but yeah. So should a woman like, leave, like, actually stay away from the house? Or... Back in those days, there would have been... put. This is where you get the idea in the Eastern culture of like the red tent and stuff like yeah, that. That's I'm going to get, I was going to say that at the end, but this was all to do with Elohim being in our midst and having the temple and the tabernacle there. Something that we don't have right now. But I'll get on to that, whether we should be doing this now, separating and stuff. Um, in Ezekiel 22, and the word of Yah came to me saying, and now son of man, judge, judge the city of blood. You shall show her all her abominations. You have despised that which is set apart to me. You have profaned my Sabbaths. In you they have uncovered the nakedness of a father. In you they have humbled women who were defiled during their uncleanness. Yah calls sleeping with a woman on her monthly flow an abomination. And the one who has done abomination with his neighbor's wife. And another has wickedly defiled his daughter-in-law. Another within you has humbled his sister, his father's daughter. You know, so I'm saying this because of what it said. Oh, just be unclean for seven days. It's not that bad. No, it's an abomination. And when a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, other than the time of her monthly separation, like the woman in the background, or when she discharges beyond her usual time of monthly separation, all the days of her unclean discharge, she shall be as the days of her monthly separation. She is unclean. Any bed on which she lies on all the days of discharge is to her as the bed of her monthly separation. And whatever she sits on is unclean as the uncleanness of her monthly separation. And anyone who touches them is unclean and shall wash his garments and shall bathe in water and be unclean until evening. 
But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she shall count for herself seven days, and after that she is clean. And on the eighth day she takes for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and shall bring them to the priest to the door of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall prepare the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. And the priest shall make atonement for her before Yah for the discharge of her uncleanness. Again, like, this, we don't see ailments as, I'm not saying it's sinful, but it's a reminder of sin. There's the difference. It's a reminder that we're mortal. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness when they defile my dwelling place which is in their midst. That was what all these laws were about. Defiling the temple that was, or the tabernacle, within them. And the, yeah. All of these laws were to separate the people from their uncleanness so that Elohim could dwell in their midst. Now, this was happening on a physical level, wasn't it? They literally had the tabernacle and they literally got leprosy and they literally got all these things and literally had to do all this. Right now, we don't have that, do we? We don't have a physical temple, but we do have the spiritual. So we can start thinking of matters of spiritual leprosy, spiritual uncleanness. You know, and what Paul said, what are these things? Greed, evil desires, passion, filthy talk. However, in the kingdom, we will have the spiritual and the physical. Again, he will be in our midst. I would suggest that we will be doing this again in the kingdom. These rules. Why? So that we do not die in our uncleanness because of his presence right there. I believe this is one of the main reasons why we're going to need a temple in in the kingdom because there will still be sinners and those sacrifices are there for the covering it's, it's, it will be a fleshly thing as it were as opposed to a spiritual thing why, why did you need the animals to be able to draw near if Yah's physical presence is going to be on the earth again and there's mortals well guess what they need that covering of blood In Hebrews, it says that the blood of calves and goats could never take away sin. It was just for the. It was literally for the purification of flesh. It was never able to take away the sin. It was there as an atonement, as a covering, but it never got rid of it. Why? Because you were reminded every year you had to do the same offerings. It didn't take away. It didn't atone fully. Get rid of. There were never. It was never about sin. That that was always for the blood of the lamb. But the blood of the lamb was slain before the foundation of the earth. So, do you see what I mean? So, we have the physical and the spiritual now. And how can one not think of those as one being blessed than the other? Let me say this flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom. This physical flesh will disappear. Once we have our new body, we won't need, you know, animal sacrifice to cover it. We won't. Right now we don't have that. I hope the main point that we can draw from this right now is be, being united with something in a state of uncleanness or in a state of leprosy. Like you unite yourself with a congregation by being there. Are you uniting yourself to something unclean? At the minute, we don't have a temple, like physically, so we can only take the spiritual matter from it, i.e. we're the house, so let's not let unclean things come in. 